JB Chemsters, this is Mrs. Vanoy bringing you Blank Wall 6.4. This is called Quantifying Heat and Work. Uh, we're quantifying, so we are actually going to come up with those values. How do you calculate heat? How do you calculate work? And that's what Chapter 6.4 is all about. Uh, this is kind of a long chapter, uh, so it's probably going to be divided up into at least two, maybe three videos. Please have your calculators very handy. Uh, and if you need to go get them, then pause and go get them, okay? Uh, I'll be, when you do that, come back, and I want to review what we've already done. So I'm back at an earlier page, and I starred this. Look at that big star. Notice it's gold and black. Uh, anyway, so uh, I said you really, really, really need to know this chart. And let's go back and look at it. So if Q is heat and it's positive, it means the system is gaining a thermal heat energy from its surroundings. If it's negative, then uh, the system is losing thermal energy to the surroundings. So for example, I, get, I told you it was like ice. Uh, ice will gain energy in order to melt, okay? A candle will lose energy uh, and it feels warm and, and whatnot. Uh, as far as work goes, Work is done on the system, so something is pushing in on that piston, if you will. Uh, if work is negative, work is done by the system as pushing out. So the, the piston is pushing out. The syringe is pushing out. And then we talked about the delta E is uh, if it's positive, the energy flows into the system. And if it's negative, energy flows out. So have that thought handy. If you need to go back to this page again, then so be it. And it's all about the idea of uh, systems and surroundings and this relationship between the two. And that is a big deal. So let's go back to section 6.4. Okie dokie. So what is heat? Remember how does um, energy, internal energy change? Remember it flows uh, from one system to another. And so how does that happen? It flows through the exchange of heat or work. So it says two systems with different temperatures that are in thermal contact will exchange thermal energy, which is uh, the quantity called heat. So they have to be in thermal contact with each other. So it can always flow from the higher uh, energy value to the lower energy value, value. So they have to be in contact for it to happen. So this transfer of energy in, in a process flows from a warmer object to a cooler one, transfers heat because of the temperature difference. But remember, temperature is not the measure of energy. It just reflects the motion of the particles. Okie dokies. So what happens here? A cup of uh, hot tea, uh, does it get hotter or colder as it sits out? Now, I bet that's not very hard for you to imagine. So what's going to happen? The hot tea or hot coffee, uh, what's going to happen? It's going to, yes, it cools down. Why? Well, because heat is lost to the surroundings, or heat flows from the hot cup to the cooler surroundings. I sure hope your surroundings aren't as hot as that tea, or you're in trouble, okay? And so, again, it goes from hot to cold, okay? So, um, what happens if the opposites occur? The tea sits out and gets warmer, huh? Does that actually happen? And I wrote... Duh. All right. Have you ever seen a cup of hot tea sit on your table and it gets hotter? Of course not. Okay. So we know it goes from hot to cold. Okay. So um, if you have already watched Bill Nye the, uh, on, on heat and you saw some of those little experiments that he does, I'm hoping that watching Bill Nye first will help you in this next idea. So if you haven't already done so, I put a link to the Bill Nye and Heat on Google Classroom, and I hope you actually have watched that. So if not, stop this, watch Bill Nye, and then come back, okay? All right, so in Section C, we have temperature change and heat capacity. Uh, heat and delta T are directly relational. We already heard that. We already saw that. As temperature goes up, heat goes up. So remember what we said, if it's the, the, the direct, we're going to the, 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 the divide. Remember that from the gas laws. So Q is my heat divided by delta T. Okay, here we go. So I get some kind of a constant. So if I rearrange this equation, I'm going to multiply delta T to both sides. So Q is some constant times delta T. 
And what is that constant? Well, hang on. What is Q? Q is heat. Oops, there we go. What's delta T? Uh, delta T is change in temperature, right? So what is this constant? It's called heat capacity. And notice the units of heat capacity. It's joules per degree Celsius, okay? And this is a constant, and it's based on what material it is. Just like density is a constant, and it's different for every material. So the same thing is with um, the heat capacity. So if you recall, uh, one of the experiments on Bill Nye, they had um, a pad of butter on a metal spoon, a glass spoon, and a wooden spoon, or something like that. And um, which one did the butter melt first with? And I think we all realized it was the, the metal spoon. Uh, that's because it has a different heat capacity than the glass and the, and the wood, all right? So it's an inherent quality on how much energy can be absorbed before it goes up by a degree Celsius, okay? So I think I just defined it here. So heat capacity of a system is the quantity of heat required to change the temperature by one degree Celsius. So how much energy can be absorbed before its temperature goes up, okay? So what's going to get hotter faster, a metal saucepan or the metal saucepan filled with water, okay? So what do you think? Have you thought about it? Hopefully you said which one will get hotter faster, the metal saucepan, without water, okay? Why is that? We know something special about water, so uh, give me a second here. Let's do the next one. So you want to cook some potatoes on the stove. You have your steel pot, your potatoes, and your water. Rank these from the slowest to get hot to the fastest to get, to get hot. So which one's going to heat up fastest? The metal, right? So then what? Which is going to heat up faster? Potatoes are water, and believe it or not, it is the water. So the potatoes are the slowest to heat up, then the water, then the metal pot. So think about how you cook those potatoes. You put it in a metal pot, so the heat from your stove, uh, you know, through conduction, will, will heat up that uh, metal pot. Then the water in that pot will heat up as well, and once it's hot, then the potatoes will start to start cooking, okay? But the water will heat up before the potatoes get hot and, and cook. So uh, that is the rank from the slowest to the fastest to get hot, okay? So water's kind of special here. And here is a chart of the specific heat capacity. Again, um, wh what is this about? It's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of what? I put it in bold, one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. So this is the specific heat. And look at the units of specific heat. All right, so now we are going to quantify, well, how much material do we need to you know, heat up? And it's going to be per gram. So notice heat capacity has no um, mass involved. And specific heat capacity does, okay? So um, which material will take the most energy to raise one gram by one degree Celsius? If you look at the numbers, they're, they're arranged, you know, and look at where water is. Water takes 4.184 uh, joules of energy before it will go up one degree. And that's what I just wrote here. So this means it takes 4.184 joules of energy uh, before one gram of water raises its temperature by one degree Celsius. So what, what, what's the least? Okay, look at the least. And I think your answer is lead. It has the smallest number. So what does that mean? It takes 0.1276 joules of energy to raise one gram of lead one degree Celsius. So it doesn't take a whole lot of energy before that lead starts heating up. It takes a lot more uh, energy to heat the water up. And I said, is that consistent with number two above? Actually, number two on the prior page. And so does the fact that the metal saucepan heats up faster than um, the water does? And yes, why? Because look at these numbers. All right, metal, copper, lead, all right, are, are less than one. Water is 4.184. So water takes a lot more energy before its temperature goes up, okay? Alrighty, Rogue. Uh, Constance knows heat capacity for substances are used to convert temperature changes in mass data. Use only the specific heat as an argument. So why would lead be a good choice of material for making 
um, cooking pot. So what do you think? Are you thinking? So why would something with a low specific heat um, be a good choice for pots, all right? I said because of its low specific heat, it doesn't take much energy to heat it up. All right, so it's going to get hot fast. You're not going to sit around and wait all day for it to, uh, you know, heat up so you can start cooking your food, okay? Why would lead be a poor choice? Well, first of all, duh, it causes lead poisoning. We don't want that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It says using only the specific heat as an argument. So I guess we, we shouldn't include that. But don't make your pots out of lead. All right, so what is a, a problem with the fact that it doesn't take much energy to heat up, okay? Well, chances are good excellent is going to burn your food, okay? What if that, that hot plate or that um, lead pot is on your stove? Eventually, it's going to get the exact same temperature as the burner on your stove. It's going to burn your food, okay? So that would be bad. You need to have a little moderating effect here, okay? So that it will still heat up, but it's not going to be so hot that, that all your food is going to be burnt. Okay, now we have something called the molar heat capacity, and it's the amount of heat required to raise one mole of the substance by one degree. All right, I'm going to teach you a little bit of a uh, geography of New York, okay? So this is where I'm from. I'm from Rochester, New York, and it sits right on Lake Ontario, okay, which is, I hope you know, one of the Great Lakes, okay? Uh, you know, there's more to the Great Lakes than just Lake Erie, which is north, you know, of here, you know, north in uh, Ohio. Uh, you know, there's Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Superior, and then there's Lake Ontario. So Rochester, New York is right on Lake Ontario. And over here is Albany. Albany, by the way, is our state capital. I didn't know if you knew that. And I didn't draw it in here, but the Hudson River flows through Albany. So it has a river. Hudson River is not as big as the Ohio River. So just, you know, it's, it's a good-sized river, but not that big. And then New York City, I don't know if you've ever been in New York City, but it kind of is in the middle of the ocean here, all right? So the Atlantic Ocean surrounds New York City. So, um, you know, they all have bodies of water, but um, they have very different uh, weather systems, believe it or not. So which city is the warmest in the summertime, okay? Well, I'll just tell you right now, it is, oopsies, Albany, okay? If you look at, um, you know, uh, climate data of New York, you'll see that Albany is warmer than Rochester, which is warmer than New York City. So which one is coolest in the summer? It is New York City, okay? But what city is the warmest in the winter? It's New York City. And which one is coldest in the winter? Brr, Albany. Okay, Rochester didn't even make any of those lists, did they? They're not the warmest or the coldest. They're the medium and the medium. Okay, so why do you think that is? And, and I'm not making this data up. It is a true fact here. So why do you think that is? Well, if you look... New York City is surrounded by an ocean. Albany has only a little river. We have a Great Lake, okay? So what's going on here? In the wintertime, uh, the water will release energy back to New York City, so it will be the warmest in the winter. But in the summertime, water will be absorbing the energy away from um, the land, if you will, so it will cool down New York City. Um Albany doesn't have that water, the, that huge body of water, do that. So is there anything to uh, cool it down in the summer? No, Hudson River won't do that. Is there anything to warm it up uh, in the winter? No, the Hudson River is not going to do that. So New York City is a much more moderate climate than Albany and Lake Ontario, or in uh, Rochester, okay, because of um, the, the differences in the waters. So it says, two U.S. states have never recorded a temperature over 100 Fahrenheit. Uh, which ones are they? You probably can guess one of them pretty quickly, and that's Alaska. Do you know what the other one is? It's not Maine. It's not Michigan. It's not Minnesota. It is Hawaii. Did you know that? All right. Why do you think that is? Alaska is so far north, that kind of makes sense. What else does Alaska have? It has a big body of water nearby. What about Hawaii? It is smack dab in the middle of the ocean. I don't know if you've ever flown to Hawaii, but it's a long trip over there because it is so far in the ocean. Again, for the same reason of New York City being a moderating effect, okay, Hawaii is even more so. It's it's in the middle of the ocean, all right? So um, it has never recorded temperature over 100. 
I don't know if global warming, if that's going to change, but I don't know. Listen, guys, um, we're going to need a part two, so don't wait to be great. We'll see you shortly. Bye-bye.